All right. Well, good morning, guys. Um, as you can see, we have a little extra prop up here this morning. It's been raining all week. It's been dreary, and I figured, you know, maybe maybe we just need a little bit of light pop so that, if nothing else, at least you remember what we talked about this morning, right? So we're talking about rhythm, and we're talking about life simplified. So you know, you know what rhythm is. It's It's kind of the regular routine, the regular way that you act and move. And so the question I have for you is, in, in your rhythm, are you, is your rhythm simple? Or is it complicated? Uh, is it smooth? Or is your rhythm tend to be chaotic? Is, is your rhythm generally in life, is it steady? Or is it conditional based on what happens? Um, so there's three things that really play into our rhythm, right? One of them are circumstances, things that happen in our life, things that happen in the world, things that we really can't control. We're not going to talk about that at all this morning. James talks about that, and you can study that in James. <laughs> uh, the second thing that determines our rhythm is choices that we make, things that we decide on. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then the third one that plays into it is that we have an enemy that has schemes. And he uses various schemes to knock us off our rhythm. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, I know it's early, I'm going to pull from the room a little bit. When I say Apostle Paul, what comes to mind to you? Characteristics of Apostle Paul. Word to describe Apostle Paul, what would you pick? Fire. On fire. Yep. What's that? Intimate. Intimate. Committed, definitely, right. A man, on a, a man on a mission. He's a bulldog, right? Yep. So, this guy who is committed, on fire, a bulldog, bold, do you know there was something he was afraid of? There was one thing that he was afraid of, and he talks about it. It's in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. It's our key verse. Go ahead and look at it. It's on the top of your bifold. So Paul says, but I fear, I'm afraid, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, by his sophistica sophisticated trickery, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So what's the simplicity in Christ? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, let's look at some common ways that we complicate our own life, that we keep ourselves, we move ourselves away from the simplicity that we can have in Christ. Okay, I listed out about 15 of them there. I'm going to just fly over them. Okay, worry is one. Worry has no value. It confuses the mind. It confuses the emotions. It, it doesn't bring any value to, to us whatsoever. Discount the power of prayer. We do that. We're carrying a load that we're not necessarily intended to carry. And we have someone who will carry it for us if we pray. Procrastinate. You want to complicate your life? Procrastinate. Put it off. <laughs> Let it pile up. <clears throat> Say yes to everything. Set no boundaries. Accept interruptions. These will clog rhythm in life. <clears throat> Participate in drama. You're welcoming in chaos. Focus on ourselves, seek affirmations, compare ourselves to others. These are all crippling patterns. Aim for control. You're chasing the impossible. Dishonesty crushes relationships. Unforgiveness. You'll become a very callous person. Quench the Holy Spirit by choosing to substitute anything besides him. Willfully sin puts us at a conflict with God. Um, anger compounds the problem. Do we know these things? And do any of these things disrupt? Are those any choices that we're making in our life that disrupt a good, solid rhythm in life? Okay, back to the key verse. Paul fears that somehow Satan is going to deceive us with his trickery, with his craftiness, and move us away from the simpleness that we can have in our relationship with Christ. That's where he wants us to live. 
So how did, how did he do that with Eve? Go ahead and turn the page, the second page. How did he do it with Eve? Well, there's two common things that he, there's two common things he still uses today. There's two things he did with Eve. Number one, he got her to question God's word. And then secondly, question God's character. Let's look at it. It's, a, it's a, in from, second, from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any trees in the garden? Satan comes along and says, did God, why, why would God say that? Did he say that? Why would he say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That's what he drops on it. I'll get. God didn't say that. But he positioned God as, as if he said that, right? So what he's doing is he's trying to get her to not trust what she understands to be God's word. Guys, if Satan can get us, his ultimate play is to get us to say we can't trust his word. When was this book written? Is this book still applicable today? That, that spare the rod, spoil the child. When was that written? Come on. We've come a long way since then. If Satan, his ultimate goal is to get us to question God's word, it's not applicable to us today. If he can, if he can get us to do that, he's going to break rhythm, he's going to break simplicity, and now we don't know what truth is. If this is not truth, what is truth? He'd love us to get there, right? Now, if he can't get us that far, he'll, he'll take us another way, which I'll talk about in a second. So let's look at how the, this conversation with Eve continued. The woman answered the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you must not eat of it or touch it, lest you die. So Eve is trying to recall back, what does she know about what God said? So she, we, we don't have time to unpack this in great detail. We did a series on this, and you can look at it. It's called uh, Satan's Playbook. But the woman answers the serpent and says, we may eat the fruit of the tree. What God said is you can eat freely from any tree in the garden except for that one. Now, there's a difference in what, how God said it and how Eve said it. If, if I said to you, after we're done today, do you know that Avalon Hotel has a brunch on Friday mornings? Let's go there, and you can all eat as much anything you want, and you can eat free. <laughs> it's a big difference, right? God said to Eve, you can eat freely of anything in the garden. Good God, let them have it all, right? And so she said, well, he said we can eat from any, so she left free out, right? And then she went on to say, and you must not touch it. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. So what Satan did, Satan's perfect. He's timing, he's crafty. He'll wait and he'll change a little bit of words so we start thinking a little bit differently. And it just kind of spurred along. So now God is very restrictive, right? And he's holding back. He, he's very restrictive, and he's, and he's holding back. So Satan's goal is to discount the word, but he's also, his goal is also to, if he can't discount the word, if, if in this room I believe Satan's going to have a hard time getting men to believe that this is not God's word, Right? We've been together a long time. This is God's word. This is truth. This word is alive. It's active. It speaks truth into our life. It is the basis of how we think, how we act, how we want. So if he can't get us to do that, then he'll just move it down just a little bit of a notch and say, maybe I can get you not to believe what God says to you, what God's call is on your life. Example, look at Gideon. So God comes to Gideon. The Midianites are picking on the Israelites. And God comes to Gideon and says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Am I not sending you? God picked Gideon 
to raise up an army to take out the Midianites. And here's how Gideon responded. Please, my Lord, Gideon replied, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Did Gideon trust God's word when he got the call? Or did he turn his attention to himself and say, I'm not qualified. I'm not, I don't have the ability to do this. Satan gets him to not trust God's word. God said, I'm calling you, lead an army and go. Is there any way that you've had a call on your life, you know that it was God telling you to do something, and you backed off because you didn't believe in your own ability, and Satan won, and he got you to not trust what God was telling you and calling you to do, the territory he was giving you to walk in. Maybe you can say, I think God said do this, but I'm too old. Look at Zechariah, okay? Jesus meets Zechariah in the temple. Actually, the angel meets, Jesus, meets Zechariah in, in the temple and says, hey, you're going to bear, you're, it, what's inside of you, the Holy Spirit's going to be on your son. He is going to have the spirit of Elijah on him. People are going to repent and turn back and come to the Lord God because of him. He's going to prepare the way for, for the coming Messiah. And men who are rebellious and wicked are going to turn to the godly for wisdom because of your son. And Zechariah says, how can I, I be sure of this? Zechariah asked the angel, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. He questions his age. He questions God's word, telling him that this is what's going to happen. When you walk with God, when you are in the word, when you hear him, and you know it's his voice, is there any place that you've questioned it and you laid down a call, you laid down a vision? That's what Satan wants us to do. He wants to knock us off the rhythm that we have. He wants to complicate it by saying, no, you're not, you can't, whatever. If he can't get you to discount God's word, he'll get, he'll get you to discount what God's word is to you. And this I know, we are God's plan. We're part of God's economy. We're how he operates. We're to lead our families. We're to, to lead our children and our children's children and have influence. We're to make a difference in our neighborhoods. We're to make a difference in the church that we're in. We're to make a difference in the neighborhood that we're in. We're to make a difference when we walk up and pay inside the gas station. Amen. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, everybody we contact with, we're his light. Jesus said, I'm leaving, and you're going to do more than, than I even did because I'm giving you a helper to live inside of you. That's the rhythm that he wants, the simplified rhythm in him. We walk with him because we love him, and we want to serve him, and therefore we're doing everything we can to bring glory to him. Satan wants to discount that, discount the power of his word, but discount the power of his word to you. Be aware. All right. Second thing he wants us to question is God's character. So Satan then says to Eve, you won't die. God's a liar. He told you that you might die. You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God's a liar, and he's holding back on you. He knows if you eat it, you're going to get something you don't have right now. He's right. <laughs> he was right. They were going to get something that God never wanted them to have. Do you know God never wanted us to know the good and evil? Why would we? Why would we need to know evil? We never had, we were intended to experience evil. Evil happened. Evil happened when Satan rebelled and said, I will rise to the top of the mountain. I will take the seat. I will be the leader. I will get the glory. And, it, and he got a third of the angels to go with him. And he was defeated like that and thrown, to hell, thrown down to earth as his holding tank 
And then God put us, us in the backyard of Satan, where Satan was, and said, hey, Satan, I'm going to show you what happens when somebody follows me. All right? And so all God wanted to do, says it in Genesis, the Father wanted man to know his voice and walk with him. That's what God wanted for us. And Satan comes along and says, eat. <laughs> if you eat from this, you're going to know good and evil. Like God. Like God knows it. It wasn't a good thing. Is God good? Do we know that God is really good? This, the, the, the story I use for comparison was Saul. If I lived back then, yes, I would want Saul to get knocked off a horse. In fact, I would want Saul to get knocked off a horse and thrown and from the horse go right into the pit of hell. That's what I would want it for Saul, right? Because he's threatening everybody that I know that's now following Jesus. But here's what takes place. As Saul drew near to Damascus on his journey to go arrest Christians, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? When the Bible repeats a word twice, a name twice, it's enduring. God is saying a very enduring Satan, a sentence to Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? Saul asks, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up. And go into the city, and you, you will be told what you must do. God looked at Saul. He knew he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Jesus talked about how the Pharisees had this religious spirit, and they were so concerned about washing the outside and, and what people thought of them and what pe than they were about what was really going on on the inside. But he looked at Saul, who was... At this time, the most rambunctious of them all, wanting, hating the fact that this story about Christ rising is spreading around, he was going to squelch it. And in his mercy and his grace and in his goodness, God goes to Saul, knocks him off the horse and says, Saul, this is Jesus who you're persecuting. Go to the city and I'll tell you what to do. And what did he do with Saul? Three missionary journeys. Took him out to the desert, trained him himself. Three missionary journeys. Had him write half the New Testament. Wow. Is, is our God good? Sometimes we think that we can't be used from God because of something we did back then. Review the story of Saul and just ask yourself, is my God so good that he can still choose to use me? Is he calling me to, and, and do, how, do I, how do I respond to that, right? What do we do? It's common to have made mistakes going backwards. It's common. What do we do when we fall into deception? Well, the story continues in Genesis. This is what happened to Adam and Eve. God comes to the garden like he did every single day. You're going to hear my voice, and I'm going to walk with you. But the Lord called out to the man, where are you? I heard your voice in the garden, he replied, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. This is what happens when we, when, when we break rhythm, right? And we complicate our own life. Is fear sets in, guilt sets in. Fear and guilt are then followed by shame and hiding. Read what happened with David. So David, you know the story of David. Man, what he did for the Lord, the way he walked, his life was his simple devotion to Christ when he was a shepherd, killing lion, killing bear, killing Goliath. It was simple for him then. He loved the Lord. He loved God above everything else. And anything including the giants of the, giant of the Philistines, it didn't, it didn't, he wasn't afraid because God was on his side. Later years, he, he's tired of going to war. He's up on the roof. 
Satan puts the perfect woman in front of him. He has an affair and he hides it. He writes Psalm 32 about the time after he had the affair and he had her husband killed. What was going inside of him? What was going on inside of him before he, Nathan came and he confessed? Read it. Psalm 32, 1 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was drained as in the summer heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. <laughs> Is God good? Yeah. So what do we do? I mean, what do we do with with, with life, if, if we want to have a simplified life. And what is a simplified life, right? Um, God wants us to live here. He sent us the Holy Spirit to help us live here. He went to the cross and took everything for us so that we don't have to walk around with what David described. And we've all been there, right? But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. And now we can move forward with rhythm in life and with a simple life, unless, unless we introduce things that are confusing and chaotic and compromising. And so it's a choice. So we have to look at our choices, right? And then we have to realize Satan's going to come after us in two ways. To keep us from his word to discount his word, to question his word, the word itself, or his word to us. And then he's going to come after us and try to get us. Well, here's what happens with sin. When that shame comes in, we move away from God. And we don't have the relationship that we should. And we forget he's a good God. He's a really good father. He's a merciful God. He's a loving, gracious Father. And so we move away instead of pressing in, right? Paul's fear is like the way that Satan deceived Eve with his craftiness. He will do that to us and break us from the simpleness of our love and devotion to Christ. My fear, after all the times we've talked about it, is that you won't establish this. Because, I don't know because, because you have guilt, because you have shame, because you don't know how good and loving and gracious and merciful the person, the God of the universe who meets you here is. And so God wants us to wanted us just to walk in the garden and hear his voice. God still wants us to meet us in the garden and hear his voice every day. He did it every day. I've shared this. The best thing that my mentors did for me is underscore that this is the biggest thing that happens in my life every day. The time that I have when I meet with God one-on-one. -on -one. It changes my world, it changes my life, it changes my outlook, it gives me rhythm, it gives me a simpleness for living that I cannot have unless I'm meeting with him and I take his word there, right? And I take his, acknowledge his goodness there. My biggest fear is that when I'm all done, and as many times I've said it, you still won't do this. <laughs> I encourage you, don't let another Friday go by when you don't develop somewhere on your property and say, this is it. This is where I'm going to meet with God every single day. I'm going to start as awkward as it may be, but I'm going to start. I'm going to start talking to the God who walked with Adam and Eve every day in the garden. He wants to meet with me every day. And I'm going to say, God, here's where I'm at. I wish my, I had a rhythm, better rhythm. Help me with rhythm. And just talk to him about it. Watch what happens. Our God meets us there. He'll answer us there. 
He'll change your world there. I fear that we won't do this. <laughs> when it's the, one of the most powerful things you confess there, you get forgiveness there, you give forgiveness there, you get assignment there, you update there, you celebrate there, you worship there, you ask questions there, you chew on the word there. It's such an awesome place, I don't want to leave it sometimes. But our enemy will want us to keep us from there because you're too busy. Because there's the rhythm in your life is too complicated. It's too congested. There's, 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 the, there's too much pressure going on. You can't have time for that. If I, if I, if I go there, I can't, I can't answer all this. He's saying, whoa, I got this. It's simple. It becomes real simple when you love me above everything else and you start loving other people more than anything else. Your life just got simple. Now the rhythm happens. Some of this is our own choice. Some of it is an enemy. Most of it is our own choice. Some of it is the enemy. All right. We have to encourage each other in these things. I'm going to send it to the table, so let's have some time of encouragement around the table, and then I'll come back and we'll wrap up. All right, guys, let me pull from the room real quick. Um, so as you were discussing, what, um, what are some things that, that we do ourse to ourselves to complicate our life, to break a good rhythm, to make life not be simplified? Anybody? Common things. Yeah. What's that? Anger. Anger. Yeah, yeah, anger. That one will creep up, right? And what, what good does it do? I was invited to go to the Braves game Monday and to go on the field for batting practice. And the eclipse was happening, and so I watched it with my wife, and I timed it where I could get down, and I got on 400, and there was a wreck, like a truck on fire wreck. <laughs> so I had to get off the freeway, and they're snaking us around. Now we're ready to get back on the freeway, and one car goes in, and they let one go, one car goes in. So it's my turn to go in. As I'm going in, a guy speeds up and lays on the horn. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to live the Walking Tall movie. <laughs> it's like, I did. I put my hand on one, and he went like back like that, and then he did a big vape thing, and I was like, "Oh, this ain't worth it." But, but for a second, I almost compounded my my life, right? All right. And so then we get down there, we get in line, and the guy that I'm with gets mad at, at somebody else because there was an exchange. It's like, it's, anger's a, a common, common thing. It, it compounds our life. I don't think Satan has anything to do with that. That's just something that happens, 
and we decide how we're going to react to it. Right? But but be aware. What's another one? Something that we do to to compound our life. What's that? Murmur, complain, murmur. Yeah. What good does it do, right? What good does it do? All right. Anybody? One more. Let's do one more. Worry. Yeah. And said, Sandra, do you believe you were called by God to leave your where you were to do this business? How does that make you feel? And instead of the worry we heard before, he goes, oh, it's empowering. It's really. And he just changed his whole attitude when we put it to the way you said it. When God called you to do that, how did it feel? It wasn't worry anymore. It was confidence and empower. Just that simple way of turning it was amazing, wasn't it, Sandra? Right, Jefferson? Uh, we had a, two guys in our neighborhood, myself, two other guys. We celebrated one of the guys' birthdays yesterday, right? So the three of us went out to lunch. And so I asked the question, hey, so we all had a birthday within the last six weeks. What's your goal for the year, right? Like, what do you want to change? And so one guy said, I, I need to stop worrying. I said, what do you mean? He goes, at least 45 minutes a day, I stare at the screen and look at my 401k. <laughs> I'll leave, and then I'll come back, and I'll just look at it. <laughs> he said, because I need it to get to the finish line, and I'm afraid. And so it's like totally unproductive time, 45 minutes a day, right? And we can laugh at that, but whatever we're worrying about is the same thing. There is no productive value. But I can tell you what you can do with worry. Take it to the bench. Give it to the man who's in charge of everything. Our father who who knows. Dan. There was a thing if anyone's read the Rick Warren book. Um, purpose, purpose Driven Life. He has a... Yeah, so Rick Warren in Purpose Driven Life, I think he has a, a bit in there. He basically saying, think about how much time you, you worry and how intense that is, and you don't even have to try to do it. And if you know how to worry, you know how to pray. If you can flip that, that energy and focus on prayer. Exactly right. Bill. One of the things that we talked about at our table was the, the, the choice of reacting to circumstances, which is your situation with the car, which we've all faced or preparing for them. So we have to think about that. Well, how do I prepare? Well, we go to the bench. So it all connects for me, and, and I find it cyclical. I find myself reacting and having to go back to the bench to deal with the reaction, which takes me back and forth. So it's a process. It's a sanctification process. Yeah, it's a process, and it's daily. How often did God walk with Adam and Eve in the garden? Every day. Every day. That's what he wants to do with us. All right, did you get to the question on discussing the simplicity that is in Christ? What, what does that consist of? Anybody? Surrender. Surrender. That's what our table said as well. Surrender is a big part of it. Um, so Jesus was asked the question. You know, he, he had dismantle the Sadducees, and so here comes the Pharisees, and one of them's a lawyer, and the lawyer says, hey, I have a question for you, Jesus. What's the most important commandment, right? And he gave us the answer, and, and this is the simplicity that is in Christ. Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love. You know what the secret to love is? Commitment. You know what the secret to commitment is? Choice. <laughs> right? So, Sandy and I were, were talking about this. You know, the wedding vows are interesting, right? So, basically, you're saying that I love you, I'm going to stay with you, even though you're going to make my life worse, we're going to get poor, and, <laughs> and we're going to get sick. 
but I'm committing to you and I'm making a choice that I'm going to love you through all that. That's pretty simple, right? <laughs> That's pretty simple. <laughs> right, right. And so Jesus is saying, I mean, that it's simple. If we love God, if we meet with God daily and we hear his voice, daily, we love him, we go there because we love him. But love is the simplicity that's in Christ. And Satan wants to take us from the simplicity that's there. It's surrender, but it's, it, and, it, and it's absolute love. I put down an example of, of three guys who, who knew that, right? So these three guys had high-ranking positions in the most powerful country working for the most powerful man in the world. And they had a choice to make. And they could lose their job. More importantly, they'd lose their life. And here's their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up, because we love the one true God, the Father, right? And therefore, we act accordingly. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. That's where God wants us to live. All right, guys, close at your table. We need 10 tables remained up it's over in this area right here for a luncheon tomorrow. And uh, I think that's it. We're good to go. We'll see you all next week. Hutch will be with us next week. Thank you.